Hi, I'm Rachel Adedin. And I'm Miles Stokes. And we're the hosts of Rachel and Miles Explain the X-Men, a weekly podcast all about the ins, outs, and retcons of our favorite superhero soap opera. We're also the hosts of Rachel and Miles Review the X-Men. Which you're watching right now. Where we talk about the X-Books that come out each week. Now, if you've been watching this series, you might notice some changes behind us, because this is the last set of video reviews that I think that we're going to be recording in this apartment. Indeed, we are Yay! moving to an underground volcano base where we will imprison the X-Men and turn them into it's infants. It's not an underground volcano base, dude. We've talked about this. It's Castle Sexy Dracula. Can we still turn the X-Men into infants with a weird robot nanny? Under no circumstances. Oh, that's probably for the best. Anyway, this week we're going to be looking at the books of July 22nd? July 22nd, 2015. We are moving, so we're a little bit preoccupied right now, because, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of that. This time, speaking of a lot, we have six X-Books. Next week, we're actually going to have zero. That's so... ridiculous. Yeah, Marvel, come what on. What are we going to review? Uh, we're going to review moving a lot of boxes. We could review maybe. the house, I guess. I suppose we could. But regardless for now, let's talk about some X-Men. First up is Uncanny X-Men number 35, written by Brian Michael Bendis, with art by Valeria Shiti and colors by Richard Eisenhoff. And I think we kind of forgot this book existed. We kept talking about number 34 as if it was the last issue before number 600, and uh, it wasn't. There was one more. Um, further, in one of our recent podcast episodes, a listener asked what we wanted to see. I mentioned I really wanted to see more of this team of kids in action, the children of the new Xavier School, and hey, that's exactly what this issue is. Now, are we really sure that this is actually the last one? I mean, I, I think so. I've been following the solicits, unless I have, like, selective memory or something. Like, you know, the thing where you can only see half of your plate and they have to turn the plate and then you, you can, can see the other half. You can only see odd-numbered or even-numbered issues of, of Uncanny. Maybe. Well, this is getting weird. That would make the podcast a lot easier to do, though. Half as many issues. What does Oliver Zacks have to say about Uncanny X-Men numbering? Probably a lot. But, um, anyway, yeah, so that's basically what we see. We see the students that Cyclops and Emma and Magic and Magneto were teaching, um, kind of operating as their own superhero team after what happened in last issue with uh, them and Dazzler going after Mystique. I should point out, if you're judging this issue based on the cover, that the, the axiom of not judging a book by its cover applies pretty heavily here, since the cover has absolutely nothing to do with the contents. Neither of these characters actually appear. Right, but what we do see is, you know, Tempest and Triage and Gold Balls and Benjamin Deeds and the Cuckoos and, you know, the whole young team basically going off and being superheroes and very quickly finding themselves celebrities. Is Tempest around? I thought she'd quit. Oh, right, yes, Tempest is gone. That's quite true. She's off doing, mm. you know, other stuff. Uh, but, yeah, and it's... Great. What we see is Gold Balls as the focus of all of this, you know, becoming like the, this media darling and also yelling, Gold Balls! Which, you know, his logo is in the speech bubble every time he does anything. And it's this sort of like meteor meteoric rise and fall of celebrities. And what it kind of reminds me of is Latter Day New Mutants when the kids were more on their own mixed with ecstatics. And I really like that. I This is probably all we're ever going to see of this premise, you know, of these kids doing their own thing. But it makes me a little sad because I really, really enjoyed it. See, I was less fond of this, and I'm especially less fond of this as the as functionally the end of a run. We're gonna get 600, but not till October, and this felt anticlimactic to me, because to me, Uncanny was the grown-up book, and I love those kid characters. I think they're great. Don't get me wrong, but ending with them, and especially ending with what basically amount to two one-shots about those groups of kids. I mean, this didn't close the series in the ways I wanted to, it didn't wrap up the storylines that I was following it for, and it feels incomplete. It feels like a couple issues of Phil. Very good Phil, but Phil. See, for me, I see these issues more as transitional, because it's very clear that Uncanny X-Men 600 is going to be the last issue of both Uncanny X-Men and all-new X-Men, and I think that's why the last issues of each of those series before it feel a little anticlimactic. They're designed to be to be bridges toward this big climax, whatever it's about. Now everybody's back at the Jean Grey school, basically. Um, everybody's as together as they can be, except they're Cyclops and Havoc with their own weird plan. So... I don't know. I uh, I think it's all going to come together or not with 600. No, if they're bridges, I want more solid bridges. These don't feel like bridges. These feel like floating islands. Mm -hmm. Well, fair enough. Uh, I guess the, uh, the the future shall tell how they hold up together, but individually, uh, you know, as you can see, opinions vary. Next up, we'll move on to Battle World with E is for Extinction number two, written by Chris Burnham and Dennis Culver, with art by Ramon Villalobos and colors by Ian Herring. As you may recall, I was lukewarm on the first issue of this series, and I said I, was, I really wanted to wait till the second one to, to make a final judgment on it. Oh my god! It's so good! So good! The first issue had me lukewarm. I wasn't really sure. I mean, Villalobos I loved. I felt like he was the perfect pick for this. Villalobos and Herring. I wasn't certain 
about Burnham and Culver, and I really wasn't certain about their extension and take on Morrison's X-Men. This issue really turned that around for me. It made this series not just a cool thought exper experiment, but a really cool story. Villalobos continues to be spot on with the art, and Herring's colors are this amazing, saturated, technicolor, just intensity that again just perfectly fits that almost sort of rave early aughts tone. Yeah, I mean, for me, it felt like uh, nothing so much as a really cynical, like, punk new wave music video. I mean, both in terms of story and in terms of art. Like, if Quentin Quire were to make <laughs> X-Men happen, it would look like this. It's also got a fun alternate version of Quentin Quire, which mm -hmm. always gets bonus points from me. Um, and yeah, it's clever, it's interesting, it's smart, it's a great, great aesthetic continuation and extension and metamorphosis of the works that it's spinning off from and has very much established its own voice and story with this issue. If you're not following this series, it's one I'd highly recommend picking up, especially now that the second issue is out. Next is what I believe is the penultimate issue of Magneto, number 20. This is written, as always, by Cullen Bunn, with art by Paul Davidson and colors by Paul Mounts. So this is uh, the second-to-last part of Magneto's Last Days storyline. It's him uh, basically attempting to do one last heroic sacrifice to uh, burn himself out and save the world and prevent, uh, you know, the world from ending. We all know how that goes which I think remains part of the problem, kind of, with the way this story is going. It's, it's, it's all about whether or not he's going to save the world, when really I think a Last Day's story should be about how you deal with the end of things. And I guess, to a degree, this sort of does. I mean, that's exactly what Magneto would do. He would try to commit suicide by apocalypse and basically prove to himself and to the world that he is, in fact, a good person. But even so, that foregone conclusion, I think, does take away a little bit from it. I cannot handle the colors in this issue. There are points where it's obviously aping Jordi Belair's palette, where it's workable in flashbacks, but the bulk of the book, I read this on a screen and it gave me a splitting headache. Yeah, I mean, the art team does seem to be going for a, uh, a severe contrast between the present day stuff with Magneto and Polaris, you know, doing zappy power stuff, and the past stuff, which is more about kind of how we got to this point, more psychological, more character based, with Magneto and Raleigh and Polaris and all of them. And what I find is that the flashback art, which is much more reminiscent of what mm -hmm. we've seen in the book so far, yeah, of, really of Walter works and Blair. for me. Yeah, and, and I think uh, Davidson and Mounts um, do a good job of picking up what worked with that and doing their own take on it. The present day stuff is definitely glaring, and while it does succeed in contrasting, it's, like you said, it's, it's overly gaudy and harsh. Yeah, the contrast shouldn't be between not good and good, and that's what it kind of seems like to me here, especially with the colors. The palette on the present day stuff just absolutely baffles me. I cannot imagine why you would choose to color a lot of this book the way you have. It's glaring, it's cacophonous, and it's glaring and cacophonous without being effective. Like, for example, the colors on E is for Extinction are very, very bright, but here they just feel messy. There's too much, there's no focus, and it makes the book actively more difficult to read. It impedes the storytelling, and that really bothers me. Mm -hmm. um, art aside, some of the story stuff, again, specifically in the flashback areas, is really cool. We're seeing more of this kind of cult of personality mm -hmm. composed of, of people who have been severely injured by Magneto. The new acolytes. Now, the new acolytes, who are now just obsessed with him. And I gotta say, this is brilliant. Mm -hmm. It is disturbing and dark and makes a lot of psychological sense. And it's got, it works with the sort of subtle, quiet horror that this book mm -hmm. has really excelled at. So that right there, spot on right up until the end. We also get to see more of Raleigh, Magneto's sort of benefactor, and learn a bit more about why she's done what she's done. And with that, I think we're working toward a very interesting, satisfying, and earned conclusion. Next up, we have the Digital X-Men 92 Infinite Comic Number 5, written by Chad Bowers and Chris Sims, drawn by Scott Koblish and colored by Matt Miller. Uh, if you've been listening to these reviews, you know the conflict of interest disclaimers that go with this book. It's co-written by my best friend, um, and we're minor characters in it. Yes, we in are. In fact, I think we actually make our, our last official appearance in, in this <sighs> issue. We had but a good we, do, run. we do get to yell, we can explain, which... <laughs> <laughs> yep. Spoilers? Not actually a spoiler. It doesn't actually indicate anything about the plot. Um... X-Men 92 continues to be absolutely delightful. I think it's a book that's going to be pretty easy to follow if you've come in through just the cartoon, or if you've come in without a lot of working understanding of X-Men, but, for example, have any familiarity with the existence of the 1990s. 
It's really fun. It's really bright. One of the things that really struck me again this issue is just how utterly spot on Kolish's faces are. Yeah, especially the way he does Psylocke. Yes. I freaking love. Oh my god, yeah. Yeah, man, I want to see more from this specific team. Like, mm-hmm. these four working together. Because, you know, one of the things that Chris and Chad talked about when they were on the show is how much how much Scott specifically brought in, in terms of the gags and the visual orientation. And every page of this that I see, like, this is what I want comics to be. This is that kind of fusion between text and art and really active collaboration between writers and artists, and it's so good. Yeah, and now obviously this is a lighter and more ridiculous book than most of the other ones out there, except for maybe, you know, giant size Little Marvel. Are you kidding? It addresses serious topics. It actually kind of does, but more interstitially. I guess that's true, but yeah, it's just so excitable and wide-eyed and, like, sugar-high. Um, we, we get to see more of this comics version of X-Force, mm. which is, you know, like, Bishop and Cable and Archangel and Psylocke, and it's hilarious. They're so dark and violent and yelly. It manages to be homage and, and satire at the same time, which impresses me. Like, it's so loving, and it's so enthusiastic, but it's also so actively and directly and aggressively making fun of a lot of the sillier stuff that, you know, did inform X-Men, and especially the X-Men comics in 1992. There was a sequence in particular that I really loved. Actually, this is more the TV series where Cassandra Nova is just breaking down Jean and her relationship to the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And it's some really salient criticism just twisted for the villain to use to get into her head. Right. And actually, all, everything with Jean and Scott, I thought this issue did yeah. a phenomenal job of looking at what was cool about their relationship in, in the 90s. And that's that's refreshing. As, as someone who grew up reading those comics and has always been a big Scott and Jean together fan, like, yes, more of that. Right. And the X-Men True Love should be a completely badass combat team-up move. Right. Seriously. Next is Old Man Logan number three. Written by Brian Michael Bendis with art by Andrea Sorrentino and colors by Marcello Maiolo. Guys, I... Okay, so I've been enthusiastic about a few different Secret Wars books, specifically, you know, Inferno and Years of Future Past. Old Man Logan is quickly becoming my favorite book in the entire line. This book, the pacing and the stylishness of it and just the the feel of the dialogue and the images, it all just paints a perfectly consistent, concise, and quiet picture of what it should be. You know, we have Wolverine, the adamantium last cowboy, just exhausted going through the world trying to figure out what's going on because he doesn't know what else to do. It's kind of a perfect comic, and we've talked about how issue threes are hard to get right. This issue three is so freaking engaging. I want to talk about Sorrentino, and I want to talk about Sorrentino's art. Yeah. Because, well, I mean, obviously that's what I want to talk about in context of this book, but Sorrentino is such a stylish artist and brings such a design sensibility to this book. I mean, on one hand, there's the very gritty, almost um, almost film-still-looking stuff. But there's also just this intense, almost, God, almost early Frank Mm Miller-esque, you know, hyper silhouette designs, just incredible integration of sound effects. And yeah, God, yeah, actually it reminds me a ton of early Miller and especially actually Miller Masalucci Daredevil too. I can totally see that. Yeah. Everything just feels textured and kind of gross and I I love it. Well, or very, very crisp. And those two things are contrasted together with incredible effect. When we saw Sorrentino on Uncanny X-Men, he was doing something very, very different, and I appreciate that, too. Like, he's someone who's innov- we've seen innovate really significantly on multiple books in multiple ways mm-hmm. that really fit the tone of those respective titles. Yeah. So this issue, we see Logan, you know, of the old man variety, oldest Loganus, or everybody Loganus <laughs> oldest, anyway, uh, going through basically the age of apocalypse, you know, just being careening from one reality to another as he tries to explore and find out what's going on in the world, learning that doom is God, for instance. And Man, one of the things I really like about this issue in particular is because he's in the Age of Apocalypse and because he's finally entering the parts of Battle World that start to overlap, he sees a Thor and Apocalypse confront each other. And it's one of my favorite sequences in any comic recently, period, because he is just so small and insignificant and irrelevant between these two almost divine forces. And he also has no idea what's going on, and it really sells that thematically as well as situationally. Freaking 
love it. Um, we're going to see, not the whole creative team, we're going to see Andrea Sorrentino doing the new Old Mad Logan series once Secret Wars ends. And if we can keep that same kind of sensibility, that same feel of Logan as just this, this tired wanderer who knows he's a man of violence, but is just so sick of it that he almost doesn't want to bother, if we can get that in... Uh, Logan's body language and facial expression and the images around him, I'm going to love the hell out of that book. With Jeff Lemire writing, it seems pretty pretty likely. I'm feeling really good about that. So yeah, Old Man Logan, um, in a way, I almost wonder if this is uh, one of the more essential Secret Wars books to pick up regardless of what lines you're following, simply because it really does explore how the worlds interact and maybe where they're going since we know Logan's coming out of it. But regardless, buy this book. This is one of the best of this entire event. Finally, we've got Star-Lord and Kitty Pride number one, written by Sam Humphreys, with art by Alti Fermansaya and colors by Jessica Colleen. Uh, starring actual Disney prince Peter Quill in a musical of extravaganza. This issue is ridiculous, guys. It's fun. Um, it's, I don't know if the kitty in it is actually Age of Apocalypse kitty. I was a little bit, um, baffled on that one. But man, this is a really fun book. The art is lovely. It reminds me a lot of Peter Wynn, if you're familiar with him, in, in both tone and palette. And it's just a happy, fun, and I think probably heist-oriented book. It's very pretty. Um, it's very much a book that I would say is designed for Tumblr image sets in terms <laughs> of, of ridiculous and splendid moments. And yeah, um, it, it definitely opens with Peter Quill singing Disney songs. And along those lines, I was surprised at just how cartoony this whole thing is. I mean, yeah. at one point we see Gambit with hearts for eyes talking <laughs> to Kitty Pride, And I mean, the plot itself, the dialogue, it's all very like clean and crisp and fast yeah. flowing the way that a Disney movie is. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing, and I think it's a thing to which Peter Quill is singularly well-suited. Especially Earth-616 Peter Quill. This is one of the only books starring mm, a character yeah. that came from the main reality and in knows Secret Wars. It. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is also fun and, and, and interesting and surprising, because you'd expect that to be the grittiest book, and not the sort of most bright and lighthearted, which it very much has been so far, at least of the ones that we've been following. Mm-hmm. It's a fun book. If you like interesting, lighthearted, romantic romps um, with a lot of period trappings, you will dig this book. If not, you probably won't. Um, but it's worth at least a look because it's very pretty and it's a really, really fun read. Six out of six. Rachel, what's our pick of the week? Our pick of the week this week is Is for Extinction number two. Uh, it turned the series around for me. It's great storytelling, it's a lot of fun, and I think it's a pretty good example of why Secret Wars is a cool event and what makes it work. For me, though, the improvement from number one and the extent to which issue two really kind of justifies the series narratively totally sells it. So yeah, is for Extinction number two. Pick it up, give it a read. What's our panel of the week? Our panel of the week is actually four panels. Have you noticed that we cheat a lot on <laughs> panel of the week? We'll... We're allowed, it's, it's our thing. It's our freaking show. Yeah, uh, we, are, so, we are the bosses here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Power. these four panels, they're across the bottom of a two-page spread, and I just love the tension. I love the pacing of it. I love just the stakes that it shows. You know, th this standoff is clearly about to erupt into something awful, or maybe it's not, and you're kind of on the edge of the seat waiting to see what happens. I described this book earlier as very designy, and I think this sequence really highlights that beautifully not just in its use of color, but it's in its use of sound effects and visual iconography. Mm -hmm. So that is it for this week. Thanks for watching. If you like what you've seen here, please check out our podcast, Rachel and Miles Explain the X-Men. New episodes go up every Sunday at rachelandmiles.com, also on iTunes and Stitcher. What have we got for them this week, Miles? So this week we'll be taking the New Mutants from the Mutant Massacre to the Giant Size number 50. We have a whole lot of time travel, the return of Xavier, a bunch of stuff in limbo. It's very eventful and actually some of my favorite issues <laughs> of the series. That podcast, these video reviews, and everything at rachelandmiles.com come to you courtesy of our very cool Patre uh, Patreon subscribers. I can really pronounce that. We are an entirely ad-free and listener-supported project, which means that everything comes to you from the generosity of those folks. Um, if you want to join their ranks in making all of this possible, you can do that by the link either above or below, depending on where you're watching this video. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like we mentioned earlier, there are no X-Books coming out next week, except for a print copy of X-Men 92, and we've already covered the digital stuff, so there you go. So we will see you in two weeks where we will be recording from our secret volcano base. Castle Sexy Dracula. Either way. It's going to be weird doing video reviews not in here. Like, I don't know what my new office is going to look like. And...
here. I mean, I, I moved I moved the Susie Durkin's altar mm -hmm. so that there would be something there. But like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if I'm bringing that shelf for sure. Would it help if we called it the danger room? Yes. Can we get a plaque for the door? We can. We shall. Can we get spinning blade traps? I think that might violate the terms of our lease. 